Now, I want to ask you about something specific. So, we Muslims, we are taking from our role models the sound theology. We're taking from them the rules of worship and transactions, and then all the other things like etiquette, manners, purification of heart, and manliness. Now, these things we should absolutely not take from the unbelievers and the ignorant preachers. This is correct. I would say that there are five main attributes of someone that's a qudwa to Islam should have for us to take from them. Five main attributes. Mm. There are many others, but I would say five main attributes that someone should possess that we would take them as a qudwa. Okay? The first would be sound theology. So they should have a, a sound and penetrating understanding of the six pillars of Iman, which is the i'tiqad mm mujmal -hmm. and then the i'tiqad al-mufassal, which are the detailed matters of the creed. They should have a good, stable knowledge of that based upon, agreed upon mutun. Right? The second is they should have fiqh to a degree in which they can help themselves, help their families, and also those that might take them as a qudwa, they can help them as well. If someone goes to someone and takes them as a qudwa, but he can't help himself, how can he be a qudwa to others? He can't, because he can't look after himself and he can't look after others. The third that someone should have is the muru'a, the masculinity and manliness. They should possess these things when it comes to eating and drinking. So their table manners, their clothing manners, their cleanliness matters, right? Their, their basic physical matter. These things should be established mm -hmm. so that when someone looks to take from these people, they can take from them. So they can carry through these obligations from the tying of the amama mm -hmm. to proper wearing of the galabiyah and the azar, right? And these, th these things sometimes have to be shown instructionally because if people have never done these sunnah, they might not know how. To show them this is how you wrap an izar. This is how you wrap an amama. This is, no, don't wear this under it, wear this under it, right? To show people how to carry these things out. Listen, when you sit down and eat, not your left hand, I know you might be left-handed, but you should eat with your right hand and drink with your right hand. If you if you write with your left hand, that's up to you and other things. That's, that's obvious, that's different. But we're talking about eating and drinking should be done in this capacity, mm -hmm. right? When you When you eat and drink, you serve your guests first right? When you eat and drink, it should be, you know, your best food. You don't give your food, your guests the worst food and then keep the best for yourself, right? The people should be taught these things in a very careful and deliberate fashion, right? Basic physical strength, mm -hmm. right? And then some type of training. Everyone's got to have some type of ritual, whether it's going for walks or, or jogging or lifting weights. They should, if they don't see it, they should certainly know and be able to recognize that the person taking as a qudwa has mm -hmm. these basic things, that they have basic physical strength, right? Because again, the people that are being taken as uh, role models by some of the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm. even though they are slim, they don't look physically strong. Mm. They they look gaunt and very weak. They they To me, they look like drug addicts. They don't look mm -hmm. very physical because their legs are very spindly and they don't look strong. They don't, they don't, give me an air of physical strength. I, I would think if I was going down the street with them and a fight happens, okay, I'm on my own because mm. I don't believe that, that they would be able to be part of self-defense. I just, and, I don't believe it. And many of them are constantly consuming intoxicants, which they openly show. Yes. Yes. And these are, these are things that are going to take away from your, your physical viscosity. So that's an aspect of Murua. Another thing is you should be looking at these people where, do they have a family? Are they married? Do they have children? And are they established on that? Mm -hmm. So this is the fourth point. So they've got they've got a family. Yes. All right. How do they treat their children? And how is that according to the revealed law? How are their children? If their children are really unruly and out of control and everything else, they're thinking, well, why are they like that? Or if they're always beating on their children, always yelling on at them and things like that. Their wives, if they're not married, why? How come they're not married? Why aren't they married? Why aren't they in a stable marriage? Well, you know, there are no good women out. Wait a minute, hold on. 55% of the Ummah's women and there's no good ones? 
all of the Umba's women are prostitutes and whores. All of them. Now would have been. And you see, people don't realize mm. that by repeating these statements, someone yes. might physically attack you in public and say, well, mm-hmm. why would they physically? Because when someone makes a statement like that, someone, a normal person is immediately thinking of his own mother and his own women folk. Mm-hmm. And so when he hears someone make a statement like this, thinking, wait a minute, he's talking about my family. Even though they didn't mention them in, in, in they didn't mention them by name, the implication by saying all or any. No. And this is why this is the reason why Chip Khala got stabbed. We mentioned before on stage in Algeria, mm. where he said, "If you if you don't know who I am, ask your sister." He didn't know the the men in the crowd didn't know which sister he was talking about, but each one thought he's talking about my sister. <laughs> so they dived on stage and went after him, and now he lives in France. Oh. Right? There's a reason why that happened. You don't have to say, "Oh, I never mentioned your sister's name." You don't have to. Mm-hmm. You spoke in general Indeed. terms. Yes. Right. Then you have to look at the istiqama. Does has is he established upon mm. looking after his family, looking after his children, looking after his wives? Is he established on that? Is he established on it? If he's not, or the person tells you, well, family's not really important. You know, I never considered marriage mm-hmm. very important. What? Right? Or well, children come and go. What? Why right? when people say oh, things wow. like that, that's a proof that they don't have istiqama upon those things and that's not a good thing that's that's not a person that should be the qudwa the fifth and final is the akhlaq and adab so how they are with themselves and how they are with others so the person that's the qudwa he should not have an abundance of major sins that he's committing above him he shouldn't have that he should he should have resisted and to fought, to to have fought against mm. the major sins where he doesn't possess them. And then in addition to that, he shouldn't have an abundance of minor sins. Right? So he's not committing major mm-hmm. sins, and he's not committing an abundance of minor sins publicly. But in addition to that, he should also not be doing it privately either. Right? Because those types of things, they will come out in the public. Because you can't hide those types of things. So he has to strive against that. So his minor sins have to be under control no. to where he can he can control them. And they are, they are few. They're not in abundance. They are few. So that way, because they are, they are as few as possible, he can recognize them when he sees them. Mm-hmm. Because what happens is if you, if you have an abundance of minor sins, sometimes a certain minor sin, depending upon the person that's doing it mm. and why, a certain minor sin can become a major sin. Mm. In certain instances, based upon the person and the conditions, right? Whereas for one person, he might do a minor sin, a major sin, but he only did it that once. And he he felt like it almost destroyed him, like he had to go through a major rebuild. Mm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it down as one, as one minor sin. Mm-hmm. Why? Because that person and what happened to him is different to the person that's, well, it's only one sin, isn't it? It's like, oh no, that gets written down as a computer, it gets written down as a major sin, right? So that person needs to to understand the distinction between major and minor sins, mm-hmm. what needs to be done to expiate them, right? So major sins, the only way is toba and to leave the thing and make firm intention not to go back to it. Minor sins are expiated through righteous deeds and certain things that he does. So understanding that so that one can purify his character, purify himself physically, inwardly and outwardly, right? So those five major sifat mm-hmm. are the sifat of the person who would be a qudwa in mm-hmm. Islam. So when you when when understanding that, then you look at, the, the next thing you do is you look at the people that were used to create an artificial crisis. Do they have all five of those characteristics? Right. Well, sure. subhanAllah, no. Okay, well then they they can't be they can't be referenced as a qudwa. Not in oh. any po- not in any, not in a positive sense. Mm. You might be able to use qudwa in a negative. Oh yeah, these people are a negative qudwa. Yeah, that's mm. true. But they but they can't be taken as a qudwa in the positive shari sense oh. because they don't possess those main five characteristics, and necessarily they're going to strip you of your masculine. Subhanallah. If you let them, and they will effeminize you. And so you find people that become effeminate. And this is this is the interesting thing because the Abbasids had scores and scores of women. Because mm. they were known for their for their fornication and everything else. They were known for that. 
And they they had scores of women, and they were described by many of the fuqaha of that time as effeminate. Wow. They wore purple robes and things like that. They they were not described in like one of the things about them is they had like feminine qualities. Hmm. Some in some aspects. Whereas whereas the the Bani Umayya were described as uh Ashab Murru'a wa Uruba, oh. men of Arabness and masculinity. Oh. Now they're both tyrants. <laughs> But look at the difference. Mm. And remember that all the Bani Umayyah, they all died in bed. They didn't kill each other. No one killed them. And they all had stable marriages, whether it was one or several wives. But they weren't wallowing in women. See, there's something to be Mm -hmm. said for that. There's something to be said for it. SubhanAllah. There's definitely something to be said for that. Whereas the Abbasids were, they were wallowing in women and money and wearing the Persian uh, uh, purple robes and laying out red carpets, which is Persian culture and and all these other types of things and telling people, yes, you should do this. And then tr- they tried to make people start praying on the Persian rugs. And then the, 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 the Ottomans carried on that practice and rolled it out to where now there's a group of slaves of Allah that think that's part of the Salah, that you got to lay out a rug before you mm. make Salah. Because that's a, that's a carryover from those periods before. But I say all that to say that the Qudwa, those five characteristics... Mm-hmm. They must have these things, and when they don't, and you follow them, they will strip you right. of your of your masculinity and your manliness if you let them. They will strip you if you let them, because because those men are craving those two things: right, wealth and status. And if they'll do anything to get it, then it will be nothing for them to take away from their own masculinity and manliness. Because the point is, we want the wealth and status. Mm-hmm. So I, I desperately want to get that. Okay, so how, how many people have we read their stories about how they wanted to become an actor and they left their family and they lived in a car for two weeks and they did all these other things. They, they put themselves through these incredible levels mm. of privation only to either commit suicide or to be miserable oh. in their later years. Now where you're thinking, well, they've got 40, 40 million pounds or dollars or euros in the bank. What are they so upset for? Why are they crying themselves to sleep every night? Why do they have to be on mm-hmm. two different types of medication? Well, because they pushed themselves to give up the essential aspect and nature of who they were to the point to where now they've reached the point where well, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm just going through the motions of thinking I need to do this thing or I want to be this person or I want to be this thing. And what's come of it? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. So that, that's the thing. You have to get put through these different things that literally turn you into a different creature. Mm-hmm. And you come out on the other side and you're thinking, subhanAllah, who is this? And it's it's not the it's not always the act itself that's the most devastating part. Sometimes it's realizing how far you've gone and then realizing how far you've got to go to get back to where you were. Mm. Because of the damage that's been done. No. You cut your family off. You cut friends off. You cut other people. Or, or people have had to cut you off for their own safety to safeguard their iman. Right. They've had to let you go. This is subhanAllah. I can't be around Mahmoud anymore. I have Ooh. to let him go. So then they say, well, so then they use the usual nonsense statements. Well, haters going to hate. That's, <laughs> that's their, that's their cop out for what. Yeah. So, so everyone else around you has this understanding of, listen, this has got to stop us too much, but they're in the wrong. That's completely contrary to Tawator. Mm-hmm. If everybody around so is saying, you've got to stop this, <laughs> literally everybody that you respect and hold in high regard are telling you, you've got to stop this. It stands to reason you've got to stop it. No, no, that that's no. Mm-hmm. They're hating. <laughs> okay. They're hating. But only for you to spend 15, 20 years down the line and then to realize at the end of it, oh, mm. I should have listened. Okay, well, now how do you come back from it? Because the coming back for it might be a longer a longer journey than going through it. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's a long drop down, but a difficult oh, climb up. <laughs> you climb your way up only to fall off. Right. So these are the real difficult things that brothers... When they're looking at a qudwa, they have to think about. They have to ask themselves, if I'm looking for a role model, for what? 
Am I looking for a role model right. for craving wealth and stuff? What am I looking Indeed. for a role model in for what? No. Oh, well, I'm looking for, I'm doing an apprenticeship in carpentry. Oh, okay. Find a good carpenter's apprentice. And by what I mean by finding a good carpenter that can that you can be an apprentice to is indeed look at his carpentry skill, but also look at him. Is his is his life stable? Even if he's a Kaffir, is he stable? Mm-hmm. If he's stable, okay, I can take carpentry from this guy. Because sometimes he might be a good carpenter, but if he's if that hasn't been the thing that's kept him stable in his life, maybe his carpentry's suspect as well. Because those type of jobs mm. and apprenticeships, you should be stable, shouldn't you? You should be you should be consistent, shouldn't you? You have to ask these types of questions. If someone's a if someone's a drunkard and everything else, is he going to show up to work on time every day? Probably not. Most instances, probably not. Mm-hmm. So you have to think when you take people as as a kudwa when it comes to these affairs and also other affairs too. Because mm-hmm. what have they done with themselves? to where they haven't benefited from being a good what have they done what have they done for themselves mm-hmm. and you always find among the social media preachers in their social life there's always something lacking that should be there whether this is their parents the children or their own uh, mental health or physical health yeah these these things are there you'll find you'll find some of those people where they've they've said oh it's uh it's not me it's him Mm-hmm. or it's not us it's them or <laughs> it's 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 not our fault it's their fault <laughs> it's it's always someone else but you'll find a lot of these people they have all these things that they say they possess mm-hmm. but then they're missing some fundamental things or you find that there's some issue where they've missed off some crucial aspect about themselves Mm -hmm. and they think well it does it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day we're all one and we're all well no you're missing off Mm -hmm. uh, things that will complete your life you're missing things for example like a father Mm -hmm. you see you telling us how to be a great man and how to how to but most of the most of the lessons aren't good lessons how to get your money up money up for what though how to stop being a loser, a loser in what though? Mm -hmm. Like all these things go back to wealth and status again. Right. A loser in what getting your money up for like, what exactly am I getting my money up for? And what exactly am I not trying to be a loser in life for? It's like, a what exactly, if you're praying five times a day, you're establishing yourself, everything else. So how would you be a loser then? You're, you're you're successful. Mm -hmm. You've been made successful. Now, so so then what they do is they they put this across on people and they say, well, you've got to have this and have that. But the fact of the matter is there may be people who aren't meant to be property developers. Mm-hmm. They bust their home for five years and fail. So then, so then what? Are those people to conclude that they're losers in life because they can't be right. a property developer? Indeed. Maybe he's not supposed to be a property. Maybe his calling is in uh, stonemasonry. Mm-hmm. Maybe his calling is in being... Uh, maybe his calling is in web design. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not in property. Maybe it's not in these other things that it might not be. Not everybody can do podcasts. Like, not everybody can no. do that might not be mm-hmm. his calling. Indeed. So, so then when he falls on his face, oh, he's a failure in life. He's a loser. Why would he be a loser? That's one mm-hmm. thing. That's not, might not be his calling. That's one thing. Be- because we need people, people in every area of life. Yes. All these types of things. And and, th- and those people uh, should work on perfecting and building themselves up to be the best forms uh, of themselves in that particular field. But you can only do that. You can only realize that goal. You you can you can only realize that goal if you've been obedient to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mm. and you understand what you're supposed to be doing. Because if you if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you've not been obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's irrelevant how much money you've got or what you're doing, you will fail. <laughs> you're going you're going to fail because mm-hmm. you're gonna have all types of problems with family, you're gonna have problems getting married, and all these people you can have, they've got 30, 40 properties. I st- I'm struggling to find a good wife. No, you're not struggling to find a good wife. No good woman probably wants you. Mm-hmm. Because because they recognize when you go into a marriage meeting, no, this guy's full of himself. He's been here for 15 minutes and all he's talked about is how much he's got and how many cars he has. And, you know, that's all I've heard. 
how many business he has, everything else. And I know if I'm married to this guy for the next 30 years, that's all I'm going to hear. <laughs> so women rightly have checked out. Mm-hmm. You see, people put it across, oh, there's no good women out there. It's like there are billions of Muslims. None of them are good. No. Oh, well, in, in my area. All right, let's look at the, let's look at the, the demographics of your city. It might be a city of 200,000 people. There's not a single good Muslim woman in your entire city. Was has, has there been like a nuclear war? Is there like, was there an alien invasion? Like what happened to the women in your area? Were, were there, have there been wholesale kidnappings or have, have, has there been a mass disappearance where there's abductions? Mm-hmm. Where did 45,000 or 150,000, where do they all go? No, you're the problem. You're the problem. You're the problem. Mm-hmm. Truth be told. I'm not, I'm not Mr. Mr. Super, super handsome, but I'm telling you, if I was dead set on getting married in my area, whatever else, I could walk outside, figure some stuff out. And then the next three months get married. Mm. It's not, it really is not that difficult. Right. <laughs> I, I could find someone 27 or 31. It would not be that hard. And it's mm-hmm. not because I'm just so irresistible. It's just, I know what would be necessary, what I have to mention, what I have to put forward, mm-hmm. what attributes I have to represent. I know what's necessary to do it. Right. These guys are worried about, she has to be this status. She has to be mm-hmm. with this degree. Yes. This has to be this. I, I, I could turn around and marry a Syrian refugee and it wouldn't even, I, it could, ahi, it could happen in a week. Ahi. That's right. how fast I could get it done. Mm-hmm. When I, when I initially got married, I was married in a month. I had one meeting, sat down. Yeah, this seems all right. Married in a month. That's how quick this can happen. Indeed. Unless you say, okay, listen, now you might not be holding out because you're falling off or because you're falling short or because you're duplicitous. It may be there's other conditions in place where, okay, I've got obligations with extended family or I have, it may be other issues. But I'm saying the artificial crises that people are making when they say there are no good men, there are no good women, there are no role models. Many of these crises are artificial. Mm -hmm. Much of it's artificial, especially with regards to role models and everything else. So you have to ask someone, if you are not on good terms or have never been on good terms with your father, how can we trust you to be a good father to your children? Right. How? How? The progenitor, your progenitor, you can't be on good terms with. How on earth are you going to be a good man? And wh- when, wh- where did you learn to be a good man to teach your children? You couldn't even be on good terms with your own father. He's your progenitor. You're carrying his family name. And if you're a man, he's given you the Y chromosome. The daughters don't carry that special. Cro- only men do. Mm-hmm. That one person in your life that means so much that has that big chunk you can't carry that guy. You can't carry him. Mm-hmm. You you can't figure it out how to get along with the, with that guy, and to go to him who's at least he'll at least be fifteen years your senior. You just got through giving us a massive lecture about how we gotta respect our elders and think about the quote unquote oh geez and all this other nonsense. And the original guy that you would owe the most respect to, who's at least fifteen years your senior, that man. <laughs> You you won't patch things up with him. Mm-hmm. You won't go and humble yourself. Well, he never did this. Why would he come to you? He's fifteen years plus your senior. <laughs> <laughs> why would he? Why would he come to you? Yeah. Even if he's wrong, he, how would he? How would he go about doing that? Well, he should be humble. No, you got to take your own advice and be humble. Mm-hmm. He's fifteen years at least your senior, at least. But this is the thinking, and it's such a funny thing that that these particular people have this thing where they're telling people how to get their money up and how to be right. respectable, but it's nothing about how to respect your elders. There's nothing in there about mm. like, you know, when you, when you hear these people talk, they have no respect for like older generations, the people that preceded them or anything. They have a proper yes. hostility towards them. And this is what I know. It's very famous that they do not take care of the weak people and the widows. As a matter right. of fact, widows are looked down upon. Yeah, they they despise they despise widows, they despise women who were taken advantage of by men like them who were looking to practice a whole lot on women before they got married yeah. and left these women with children. So now these these women, they're whores, they're no good. You made them. Mm-hmm. 
You made them in the course of you becoming the slave to Mammon and Bacchus. You actually made these women. Because the same men will turn around, men built everything in this world. Then you built these as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You made these whores as well. You're calling them whores. Let's say for the record that, let's say for the record, at least 40% of them are whores. Okay, you made them though. Right. And, And because of the fact that you made these women, you lied to them about what your true intentions were. You told them some other stuff that, that wasn't there, and you somehow avoided their brothers or whatever else who would have stomped your guts in. Because once they find out you're with the sister, you're missing teeth, hands, feet, and you're being mm. disfigured permanently. But somehow you got past them or used some type of nonsense and told them that, oh, I can't be seen with you or come to my house and all this other nonsense. And you deceived these women and did all this stuff to them. So now these women are left with with two children or whatever else, and you say, "Well, they're used up. They're not worth anything. They're no good." Well, why was why were they why were they no why weren't they no good mm-hmm. when you took them? Why why weren't they no good when you got a hold of them the first time? Why when did this happen? So so we're just not going to take care of a generation of street children. It's mm-hmm. it's no one's response. Well, it's women's responsibility. How you just got through saying. A woman can't be a father to a child, but it's not my child. I'm not taking care of it. So then who's going to do yeah. who's, who's going to do this then? Yeah. It's, it's not my child. I'm not, I'm not taking care of someone else's children. Oh, okay. No woman can be a father to a child. Okay. So mm-hmm. who's going to do this then? Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't say, you can't make one declaration and then deny the solution to that declaration. You can't on one hand advocate for polygamy. But then the women who would be the greatest benefactors of it refuse it. <laughs> mm-hmm. The women with children would be the greatest benefactors of polygamy and would be the most pliable towards it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because they've already got children and other things, and they would appreciate the ability to work within a community. They would they would appreciate it. So the people that stand to benefit the most, widows and children that women that have had children in abundance for whatever reason, the the greatest benefactors you don't want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you keep insisting that we need to follow polygamy. And that's what all the kings in the past did. And all this Mm -hmm. other stuff that you come with these nonsense uh, statements that have no ayat, no hadith behind them, nothing. But the greatest benefactors of it, you won't accept. No, no. So so where mm -hmm. do these women go then? Right. Where do they go? You don't we, we know that we know that these these worshipers of Bac- Bacchus and Mammon, we know they don't want virgins. Because because the process of getting mm-hmm. a virgin, if if things are put in their proper place and all things considered, you'll have to go through a chaperone process mm-hmm. where you'll have to meet fathers, you'll have to meet brothers, and some real fear might get put into regarding something happening to you if you step wrong. We know they don't want that. We know they don't want to have to deal with living living with a, a, a virgin wife and learning about her and being patient with her and everything else. They don't. They say that they want these virgin mm-hmm, wives, sure. but they want them to exploit them. And they right. want them under certain circumstances where they can manipulate or groom them in mm-hmm. order to engage in high-risk sexual activity with them that doesn't lead to marriage. That's what they want. They don't want virgins and say, oh, we want virgin wives. No, you don't. Because mm-hmm. if you did, there's a large enough amount of women out there. There was a um, uh, an article that cropped up on my news feed. Um, Br- British, British women clinging to their virginity because of dating market. Mm-hmm. And there's a body of uh, English, English women who they've decided, not because they're particularly religious, but because of the way that things are in society, I don't, I don't see anyone that I've met yet that I want to be with. It doesn't make any sense. Like maybe a few of them are Christians, but the vast majority of them are just like, well, I don't see a purpose of to being with these men because these men don't want to be together in the long term or whatever else. It's just sex. So now these are Kafir women, Mm -hmm. let alone Muslim women. So that's why I say these people that call themselves wanting to better themselves and get their money up and get all this other stuff up and build themselves up. They don't. They are following Bacchus, the god of intoxicants, and Mm Mammon, the god of money and and wealth. Those are the two gods that are being followed in this current age. Now, 
some of some of the Muslims have fallen into this, and sometimes it represents major shirk that will take them out of the religion. And sometimes they're just taking them as a qudwa where it doesn't represent major mm-hmm. shirk. But it is a real and present danger mm-hmm. and a harm that if you stay inside the fold of Islam and you do it, you will still suffer massive injuries, spiritually and physically. Mm-hmm. Because AIDS hasn't gone anywhere. These other things haven't gone anywhere. It's not a 1980s disease. The destruction to families haven't gone anywhere. Right? These are real situations mm-hmm. that exist. They're real situations. Mm-hmm. And it can't be all or nothing. And so Muslim brothers that have gotten themselves, again, rather than focusing on having a qudwa, a, a good role model, they've gotten themselves involved in the gender wars mm. and other wars and all these other nonsense things. But but they're they're quick to tell you that men built everything, but then they don't want to take responsibility for the majority. Of it. So many of these speakers, they complain about the women in Darul Kufr, and some of it is indeed justified, however... Mm-hmm. Are men responsible for these issues about women here? <clears throat> Just as they say the majority of men built the uh, mm. men built the majority of things in this world, that accounts for the good and the bad. Mm. So for every so for every time you have a righteous king, you have a Chinggis Khan, you have a Hitler, you have a Stalin. Those were all men. But then you also have righteous men. Imam Bulti, Imam Sarin, Brother on everything else. Those are righteous. Those are men. Right? They're all men. That's what they have in common. Well, by the same vein, uh, when you look at the cosmetics and well, women are women women in this particular day and age are so superficial and everything else. Mm-hmm. That because that's what you told them right. that you want. No, we didn't. Yes, you did. L'Oreal, Liz Claiborne, and Maybelline, although they have female names, are ran by men. Mm. The first designers of bikinis, men. The ones that designed the, the Chinese foot bounding, those were men. The high heels, those were women. Those were men. Now, women took on those things because they thought that men liked it, liked mm. it. And enough men said it was okay, so women took it on. If enough men said, actually, no, this is not what we want, then women will stop doing those things because there was a time where women. In these countries of Dara Kufr, they didn't wear the the two-piece bikinis with the thong back. There was a time where they wouldn't. Well, what changed? Men changed. Mm -hmm. There's a civil war within men. Just like the abortion laws. Before that time, women didn't want to get the abortion. They didn't think there was a... But men, because the Supreme Court of the United States is all men, with the exception of one woman, which was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The vast majority of them, it's always men. It's men that pass this legislation. Mm-hmm. There's no secret cobble of women that are dominating the world and everything. It's not. It's men. Men primarily push popular culture. Women respond to it because they believe that that's what men want. So they try to become what men want because women want to be desired and they want to be loved. And this is also due to their nature that they this do. Is it. That's it. And they want to be desired. And what mm-hmm. what woman doesn't want to be desired? So they try. Right. They they try in the hope that okay, this is desirable and this is this is something that gains you love. Mm-hmm. So women start taking on these things. So the Liz Claiborne, the Maybelline, uh L'Oreal, that's why all these companies, they are designed for that. When the men keep talking about uh this oil of ole keeps you looking youthful, women are like, okay, I need to be youthful. I need to be youthful. Why? Because the advertisements. I need. I need to be youthful. I and need to wear. I need to wear this type of clothing. Yes, they're female names, but it's men that are running these. It's men that have founded these organizations. Just, just the same way when, when in the in the Second European War, who told women to come out and work in the factories? Men mm-hmm. did. Women didn't. What what woman would get that idea? <laughs> they're in the home. What woman would get the idea to go out? What what mm-hmm. woman would get the idea? I need to be on tax ban number two so that I'm working on a tax ban. Because men, men said, well, since you're already out of the house, that's been a whole lot of money that came out. And now that we've got the men that have come back from the war, what's left over of them, that's now two people. So that's double the double the tax ban wealth. Well, man, you, you might as well stay outside of the house. But they did. So when women here in the West are saying that they need to be strong and independent, this is coming from men. 
Well, you have to remember the yes, the very first feminists. They say, well, if the feminists they were women. Yeah, who told those women the first right. suffragettes, B. Arthur and all these types of people, the first suffragettes, who told them that it was men, because around not long after the anti-slavery movements, there were suffragette movements that were headed by men. People forget that Miss Magazine, Gloria Steinem, yes, she was the super feminist of the United States, but she was bankrolled by the CIA. Hmm. And Miss Magazine was bankrolled by the CIA, which is what? Men. Oh. Again. <laughs> She's responding to this woman. In 72, the abortion legislation passes through where it goes across all 50 states in the U.S. and it becomes a norm. Why? Well, because uh, the legislation started off where a woman wanted to obtain an abortion. She was told in your state, it's not available. She thought that that was wrong. She tried to appeal it. She went to the highest court of the land and a whole bunch of men sat down and looked at the case and said, well, yeah, this is a constitutional issue. Now, recently, those same men, not exactly the same, they're different men now, but men nonetheless sat down and right. said, this shouldn't be a universal right in the U.S. It should be a state's rights issue to discuss. So they repeal the legislation mm. and now individual states, which again are mostly men, sat down and came to an agreement on which states have no late-term mm -hmm. abortions and which do. So some women that want to get an abortion have had to drive to another state or go to another state in order to procure an abortion. This is men's business. This, this is men's doing. Indeed. It's men's doing. And just like the same thing in the UK, it's men's doing. Oh. So we have to understand. Now, it's not all men, but the majority right. is men. And women are responding to it. So when women are echoing this rhetoric and men are getting, where did they get all this rhetoric? From you. Right. You told them. Now, if you want them to change, you want their behavior to change, mm -hmm. then you have to continue in this civil war against the men who have told them to do it. Somehow. And that and that civil war means going to war with the men that are running L'Oreal, Maybelline, and Liz Claiborne. You have mm. to go to war with those men too. Because they're the ones that are saying that stuff. You have to go, you have to go to war with the men from the mid-90s who uh in music of the mid-90s, especially rap mm -hmm. music, extolled the virtues of being a whore. Women, women at first they didn't they didn't like that. They protested against it, everything else, but men kept saying it's good. And you're 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 only upset if you think it's you. But if you don't think you're the whore being referred to, then it's okay. You can dance and listen to it. So some women said, okay, well, I'm not the one being referred to, so it's okay. And then they fell into it. Then it became a thing where a man says, oh, no, it's just a term of endearment. It just means mm -hmm. uh, when I use these 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 uh, swear words against women, they're just terms of endearment that mean a very assertive women. And women should be assertive, assertive about their business. And women are thinking they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now women start answering to that. Time. They start calling themselves those profane titles. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them, where did you first? They'll tell you the music they listen to, which is, which is going to be almost woolly men. Even the females today that sing that profane sludge, when you ask them who their role models were, they're going to mention other men that taught them that stuff or women that were taught by men that taught. None of these things are their doings mm -hmm. when it comes to popular culture. Indeed. Popular culture is a, is, is a man's architecture. SubhanAllah. Because what woman, what woman wants to take a string of cloth and put it put it between the, the glutes and mm -hmm. have it there. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Only a man would design. What woman wants to walk on her tiptoes with her heels suspended in the air that are five inches behind her? What woman would do that? It's not. A man did this. It's a man did this. Mm -hmm. What woman would want to have a two-piece bikini? It's, it's, it's a man that did this. The Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue wasn't designed with women in mind. It's mm -hmm. entertainment for men. That's why on one of the one of the magazines they had in the past, the, the pornographic magazine, it said, quote, entertainment for men. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. It's called entertainment for men because that's who it's designed for, yeah. which means the architecture was designed by men. Women didn't say, you know what? I want to take pictures that are going to go all across the world and be naked. No. Originally, the first silent films, when the first silent pornographic films came out, it was a man that did those. It was a man oh, that Lord. did them.
and he was taping women with, without without their knowing. And then later when they found out about it, there was an argument and all this other stuff. But the first silent ones were pornographic. Hmm. It was men. Then there's a really good book, but I can't, it's called The Jews in Porn. I was going to, I was going to, The Jews in the Pornographic Industry. I was going to buy it, but I couldn't justify it because it had so many lewd pictures in it. But the actual chapters, there was one chapter that didn't have pictures in it. And it was a really good chapter upon uh, Jewish men getting involved in pornography in Germany and how they helped, they were, they revolutionized pornography in Germany. And it's one of the, one of the things that Hitler came after them about mm-hmm. is because of the widespread, uh, the widespread use of pornography in Germany that these men happened to engage in that helped spread pornography in Berlin and other areas. But this was a, this was a men's sport. So when you see women taking on popular mm-hmm. culture, talking points, and using all this language, when you see women altering their bodies, going to male doctors right. to get their bodies altered to look like some type of male fantasy. Oh. And you say, oh, that's not what, what what men want. Then why do we have all these songs extolling women mm. having big breasts and big derrieres? Where are all these songs? I could no. quote t- ten, uh, five or ten of them, but it wouldn't benefit this podcast. Mm-hmm. But they're there. So, so when men say, Indeed. when men say, "Oh, we we ne- men men don't want that." Yes, there are a section of men that do. Right. Otherwise, there'd be no purpose for it. So, where did women get this idea? Oh, they're competing with another. No, they're not. They're competing with one another for you. They're not competing with one another for their own sake. They're competing with one another for men. That's what they're competing for. Mm. And whatever gives them that leg up, that advantage, that extra little bit of oomph, they're going to do it. Mm. So men bear the majority of the responsibility for this because that woman that's being called a whore before her virginity was taken, some man sweet talked her and told her, oh, baby, I love you. It's you and me forever and all this other nonsense or I want to go steady with you. Her men and her family, if they were present, they dropped the ball because they weren't there or they weren't paying attention to what was going on. Or when the guy came over and said, yeah, I'll just spend the night, they let him. Like, that's a major security breach to let that happen. Mm-hmm. Or she said, oh, I'm going on my first date with so-and-so. Wait a minute, hold on. Who? Who is this guy? Wait a minute, hold on. No, he needs to come to this house. You can't just go out and go on a some date. We don't know this guy. He's got to come to the house. Otherwise, he can't see you at all. They dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. That's all, that's men's fault for dropping the ball regarding these popular cultural things. That's their fault. The abortion industry and all the the things that went behind uh, obstetrics that led to the advances in abortion technology, some of it came from the Nazis, men, Mm. and then the rest from the Americans, men. And initially what they did is they started off looking for... uh, medications that could be birth control for men, but they found that two of the medications shrunk the testicles. So the men said, ah, no, that's not on the, I'm going to do that. Mm. (laughs) Instead, we'll use birth control for women. And so they devised all these strategies for birth control for women. Now, uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Janet E. Smith, she's a Catholic, but she's got a nine CD series called Uh, common sense sexuality. She's a Catholic, but she goes into huge amount of detail, citing sources and everything else that cover the history and rise of birth control and the part that men played in it and what it's done to families and women. Hmm. And she, through careful and meticulous quoting and sourcing, shows how we we have some of the women that we have today because of the decisions of some of the men. Mm-hmm. We can't get around. When it comes to popular culture, we can't get around it. Music, that's men again. Hollywood, that's men. So music, movies, and your popular culture, whether it's radio or stuff online or fashion, that's men again. Paris and Milan, that's run by, that's those are women strutting down the runway, but it's men that told them to walk like that. Right. No, no, no. Move your hips this way. Do no, 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 no. Do this. It's men that are behind all this stuff. 
whether they're a fem- well, they're gay. Well, the point is they're men. Whether they're a feminine, mm-hmm. it's irrelevant. No. It's men that are doing this. Most of the stylists of these women are men. Whether they're gay or not, they're still men. The ones that are talking about the smoky eyeshadow and here's your palette. You have women buying what are called palettes. You know, a palette used to be something that you just painted a painting using. Women are buying an amount of makeup so big in these boxes. Those boxes are called palettes, Mm. because they have the same amount of variation as an actual palette for painting on a canvas. Men did this. (laughs) And there's a section of women who won't go outside unless they've opened their palette up right. and worked over their face <laughs> and they're going to come outside. Women did not come up with this as an idea. Men did this. And we bear the majority of the responsibility. Mm. So we have to now get, listen, I don't want that. Or I don't want to see. We have to tell ladies that. But yeah, but I keep seeing that. One. Okay, yes, those men might. But the men that really want to treat you in a wholesome manner and everything else, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I did. But their whole thinking has to change. And a lot of these women, Kafir or Muslim, are actually ready to change if they see that there's a a civil war battle. What woman's going to change if they think that this is what men want? They're not. Mm -hmm. But if a large enough body of men are saying, no, actually, we don't want that, then someone will, oh, there's an alternative. Well, let me see if I can adapt to the alternative. But you've had several decades of popular culture and the industry telling women there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. So women are saying, this is just something we have to do. I'm not comfortable wearing these heels, but I have to do it. I'm not comfortable wearing this type of clothing. But it just has to be done. How many women, I mean, I remember going to work and seeing women walking into work wearing sneakers. Hmm. And right when they get to the entrance of the office, they take them off and then they put on the high heels. Because no no woman wants to start her day off like that. Now, for the eight hours that they're in work, they're walking around like that. Mm -hmm. But the moment they finish, they tell you, oh, so glad the work day is over. Take off the heels, throw them in their big purse, put on the the sneakers again. Right. (laughs) Out the door. Because... (laughs) No woman has that as an ideal. It's something they think that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And again, this is where the Qudwa comes in. No. Because we're we're taking on Qudwa who are continuing to tell women to do that. Mm-hmm. These people that are being taken by some Muslims as Qudwa haven't told women to stop doing it. They've just told them to become slaves. To, yeah, you have to be more submissive. But they're not representing any of the qualities of what's necessary for that submission. Mm. Because oh. because the submission is conditional. Oh, it has to be completely uncondition. And some of the things that they're saying, I'm thinking, are these people watching an episode of the Waltons or like old black <laughs> and white movies? Like, wh- where are they getting these ideas of like mm-hmm. women submit? What are you, 1833? Where were you, where were you born? Mm-hmm. Yes, in my time, women did this. You're you're 23. At most, you're 33, some of these men. Mm-hmm. I'm 48. I outrank you in spades. There's never been a time <laughs> where women were like what you say. That's nonsense. Guys are acting like they're 73 years old. Women weren't like this. Even in the 50s, some women had a small part-time job or like an arts and crafts center or they had a lemonade mm-hmm. stand or something they did where they sold little knickknacks from their home like Tupperware, things like that. There's no time where women just, they were just in the house. They never went out. And they, the, the only time their feet touched the ground is when they stepped over the threshold after they married or when they stepped over the threshold, mm-hmm. when they were dead being carried out. Mm-hmm. That's nonsense. <laughs> that's, that's, that was, that's never been the case. What type of world do you live in? <laughs> what type of, subhanAllah, what type of world do you live in? That's never been the case. Mm-hmm. Even the people that that try to deify the 50s, that this was the pinnacle of American or Western culture. The women back then had Tupperware parties. They sold lemonade stands. They had had knick-knack businesses. They had arts and crafts that they sold from their house. They still went in, in and out of the house. No, they weren't working factory jobs and things like that, but they were in and out of the house. They had activities because like any human being, you need activities. Mm -hmm. You can't just be... (laughs) <laughs> just be locked in. Yeah, they never went outside. Mm-hmm. That's it. No, <laughs> they went outside. Subhanallah, they went outside. So these types of nonsense things, people have to be 
kept aware of these things and understand that a lot of what's being passed off, the things that these people are demanding, they're not. They're telling, they're shaming these women for not being virgins. They're not virgins. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're the reasons why <laughs> there's a depletion in virgins in their area no. because they've been practicing on all these women, as they say, and, and deluding these women. Then these women, uh, there comes a point where these women have been done so much uh, in this fashion, they become hardened and embittered towards men. Look at these bitter women. Yes, you did that. Mm. <laughs> you did that. Oh, well, now they're going to pass that on to their children, which you also did because you said the children aren't their fault. Well, what about, uh, well, it's, it's not our fault because look at the divorce legislation. Again, that was constructed by men. All the divorce legislation that people are moaning about where they're saying, well, the, mm -hmm. the women are taking the kids and running off. Yes, but the laws around that were taken into consideration by men. And you have to go back. Before these laws, because those laws have mm -hmm. not been updated according to the current time that we live in. So the current time that we live in, divorce is happening at a higher rate mm -hmm. and women are working more outside of the house. At the time that that was brought to pass, women weren't working as much outside of the house. Mm. So they had more time for watching children. Right. So because of that, Law scholars in the UK and the US and Canada deemed it more suitable because the man was outside of the house more that the children would be with the mother because normally when a divorce like that happened, what happened? The women went to live back with their families. Mm. So the children come up with their mother and an extended family. That's what was happening in the years before. So with the rise in the 60s, 70s culture, L'Oreal, Maybelline, Liz Claiborne, all this other stuff, the culture went through a civil war between men, but the laws have not changed with respect to that. So it's produced these abnormalities and imbalances. Now, whether or not those laws should change, that's that's something that's at a scrabble party that you discuss. Mm -hmm. the, point is, the point is, this is the history of why it's like that. And this is the architecture of men again. And women would not be able to make use of these laws unless there were, there were men that allowed them to, because most of your child courts are headed by men. Mm -hmm. Most of these courts are ran by men. The English Supreme Court is run by men. The European Court of Human Rights is run by men. The oh, UN is mostly men. There is no matriarchy of women sitting on broomsticks, cackling, riding in a circle around mm -hmm. different countries in Donald Kofor saying, we have them now, my pretty. This mm -hmm. is nonsense. It's men that are doing this. Because men have, some men have developed an idea of what they think women should be. Mm -hmm. Now, there have to be a class of men within this civil war between Kaffir men that stand up and say, no, this has got to stop. Right. And that battle has to be had. And that battle will take a couple of decades to have a war. Don't have, don't declare war on the women who are part of the prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. You have to battle the men. 